Professor Sabina Brennan is going to be joining us from the Institute of Neuro, uh, Neuroscience at Trinity College Dublin and the Independent Life uh, Institute at Trinity as well. So, Doctor, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I hate technology. Um, uh, gosh, as if that doesn't make you feel nervous, Iran and Hawaii and everywhere. But I'm just so delighted there's so many of you here um, today. It's always great to speak directly to people in an audience. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, I can talk the hind legs off a donkey, so my biggest problem is trying to say everything I want in the allotted time, um, and hopefully without boring people to tears. Um, so, moving on. So, basically, um, I became an academic. I only went to, to university uh, when I was 42, did an undergrad degree in psychology and then a PhD. Um, and what really hit me when I moved into Trinity to work in academia was how much time scientists spent talking to other scientists about a tiny niche piece of science at scientific conferences or else sharing it in journal articles that the people who actually funded that research to, through their taxes never got access to. So that really, really jumped out of me. I used to work in television um, before I went to university and so really I do research um, but also I spend quite a bit of my time, I firmly believe science is for sharing and I spend quite a bit of my time trying to translate complex scientific information into easy to understand practical advice for people to use it when it's ethically um, appropriate to do so. Um, so this is a uh, the, throughout this um, talk, I'll be using some animations and characters um, that um, I developed with funding um, under two projects. So I'm doing my thank yous up front here because I'll probably run out of time at the end. So um, Hello Brain is a website all about brain health for, for, for everybody. Um, uh, HelloBrain.eu, and that was funded by the European Commission. Um, and then the other are little animated videos. I should explain to you that actually my area, brain health is my thing, but my area is aging um, and dementia prevention actually but as I've moved further and further into this it's about trying to understand how we can um, empower people to live more brain healthy lives and so that really is a, a completely relevant for people with multiple sclerosis also. Um, so um, I'm really, really excited that currently, at the moment, I am right bang in the middle of developing a website uh, and animated film specifically um, about brain health for people with multiple sclerosis. And that will be available online in November and it will be a re free resource. Um, the main website will have lots of has lots of information that will be useful for, for people, that, but this one will be very specifically for people with multiple sclerosis. So watch this space. So at the start of every single project that I do, um, the Hello Brain one um, as well, I, I, I do a survey and I ask people um, pertinent questions because I want to make sure what I develop answers the questions they're asking. So when I developed Hello Brain, for example, which is really about aging, um, I asked people what they feared most about growing old and they told me that they feared losing their memory and their independence. So at the start of this survey, and thank you if any of you took the survey, 500 people took the survey in February, um, and two of the questions we asked was, um, what did you fear most when you were diagnosed and what are your fears for the future? And this is just a very rough sort of word, you know, based on the stats we got in. So you can see wheelchair jumping out there um, in a fear mark first when diagnosed and actually if you look in losing independence is in there for fears for the future. Um, excuse me. So it's very clear that people initially on diagnosis are very much focused on the physical impact and see that as something that will impact on their independence. In fact actually cognitive um, impairments and cognitive function are one of the primary reasons people have to leave the workforce. Um, and so it's really impor Im Im important. For 45 to 60 percent of people will um, experience cognitive symp symptoms. Um, but the important take-home message is, while they can have a significant impact on the quality of your life, um, there are things that you can do to protect your cognitive functioning. And that's the kind of cognitive reserve that we're talking about, and I'll be going into more detail. So you, even if you're not currently affected, even if you have no symptoms, even if you're that 40 percent who will never have symptoms, it's it's important even for later life for you to consider brain health because having MS doesn't preclude you or change your, your risk for, the, for what happens as we grow old or if you do get affected by um, a disease like dementia. So brain health um, is for everyone. Everyone who has a brain needs to consider brain health. 
Um, so essentially, what, we're, what I'm going to be talking about today is about building resilience. We all know people who have the ability to maintain relatively stable function no matter what life throws at them. And that can be in the face of a disease, but it can also be in the, in the face of life challenges. Um, some people just seem to be able to keep on keeping on, um, while the rest of us maybe fall under the weight of whatever the challenges are that life throws at us. In the context of the brain, that resilience is, has been named by scientists called um, cognitive reserve. I was fortunate enough to meet the, 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 to do some work with the key scientists on that, and it's kind of my area of research. But the notion, this concept, came from the repeated observation that there is no direct relationship between the degree of brain pathology or brain damage from an injury and the clinical manifestation of that brain pathology or damage. So two people can incur a stroke of the same magnitude. One of them can have really, really severe symptoms and the other can have minor symptoms. What is that? Why is that person resilient and this person not? Well, that person who's resilient has cognitive reserve. There's something that he's done throughout his life that has given him a, a, a resilience to the devastation or the injury um, caused, the damage caused by stroke. Now, if that individual who has brain damage has had their brain damaged through stroke, goes in to say our, our, our National Rehabilitation Hospital and you'll hear maybe perhaps someone has lost some power in a limb or whatever and that the physiotherapist and occupational therapist work with them and they try to regain function. And when they regain function, what they're doing is actually um, trying to engage an undamaged area of the brain to take over the function of a damaged area. Okay? Now, the thing is, the person who has resilience He's been doing something all his life, most probably. Certain lifestyle factors, certain things that he has been engaging him have been challenging his brain every day. So if you challenge your brain, if you push yourself beyond your comfort zone, if you push yourself to the limits, the area of the brain that's responsible for the particular activity you're doing becomes overloaded. And it has to start recruiting adjacent areas to help with the task or finding other more efficient ways to do the task. So if you're doing that every day as part of your life, then if injury strikes, your brain already knows how to do it. So you're kind of ahead of the game. So it's a really, does that make sense? I think it's really exciting and positive. So cognitive reserve in terms of multiple sclerosis. So the link between cognitive reserve and multiple sclerosis at present is poorly understood. Okay? So the scientific research from this comes from aging literature and dementia literature really. Um, but what we do know in terms of multiple sclerosis is that all other things pe being e equal, people with high cognitive reserve lose less cognitive function than people with low cognitive reserve. Okay? Now, these are uh, brains of um, a healthy brain and a, healthy, a, a brain of someone with severe um, Alzheimer's disease. So as I said, the, the, our, our knowledge of, yeah, wow, you just said, it's a big difference, isn't it? Um, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this because this is where the theory of cognitive reserve comes from. So it comes from, and there's a lot of literature around it in this area. So big difference, you can see the atrophy and, and the shrinkage. That's severe AD, Alzheimer's disease. So that's really when the disease is very well progressed. Now, there's two brains. They're clearly not healthy brains, right? Yeah? Huge amount of atrophy, shrinkage, holes in the middle. Now, in 1989, a researcher called Katzman, he was conducting research and he was doing post-mortem, so looking at slices of people's brains who had Alzheimer's disease and then looking at slices of the brains of people with controls. And he discovered 10 cases of cognitively normal older adults who had advanced Alzheimer's disease pathology in their brains at death, but they had never shown any symptoms. So you've seen the damage. So, so, so it just sparked a whole area of research. If we can understand what was going on, what it was about those 10 people that allowed them to maintain their cognitive functioning even when there was this terrible damage in their disease. So that was 1989. So throughout the 90s, 
Several scientists have looked at it in terms of several diseases. Most recently, scientists have been studying the concept in terms of multiple sclerosis, um, and several studies now conclude that higher cognitive reserve may protect people with multiple sclerosis from cognitive dysfunction. Excuse me. Um, now, before I go on to the next bit, if you don't mind, I'm a researcher at heart, so do you mind if I do a show of hands? Do you mind if I ask you a question? Well, you put your hands up if you brushed your teeth this morning. Now, keep them up if you intend to brush them this evening. Okay? Keep them up if you consciously did something for your brain health today. Consciously. <laughs> for those at the front, have a look around. Everybody put their hand up for brushing their teeth. And we have about four or five hands up for brain health. How crazy is that? Seriously, how crazy is that? Now, looking after, looking after dental health is hugely important, hugely important, because you need your teeth to eat, you need your teeth to speak, and you need your teeth to smile. Hugely important. But you need your brain to do absolutely everything. You can't even brush your teeth without your brain, right? So here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? We teach our kids from this high to brush their teeth every day. But what, not only that, not only do we teach them the, the, you know, the, the physical act of teaching, we teach them a really, really complex concept of investment. Time spent now reaps rewards later. If you brush your teeth now, you get to hang on to your teeth for longer, you're less likely to have pain, you're less likely to need um, fillings, okay? Then you also learn if you actually do a few other extra things, like flossing your teeth, uh, like going to your dentist, like avoiding sugary uh, drinks, you increase your chances even more. Then as a grown-up, you actually come to learn, okay, you do all that stuff, and you still might get a toothache here and there, or you, you, you still might. And you know that it's no, so, so, so you know it's no absolute guarantee, but you know you're much better positioned than if you didn't brush your teeth at all. Um, now, you also know that, you know, as you get much older and later and later in life, you know, your teeth are just going to start to crumble and fall out anyway. But you've got to hold. But you've got, no, well, they are. Sorry, mine, you know. Um, and I really look after mine. But, but, but the thing is, it's about an investment. It's about pushing out the time at which the bad stuff might happen. Okay? So that's the same sort of principle with cognitive reserve. If you do the stuff, the lifestyle stuff, it builds up this reserve, it pushes out the time at when which you may. Now, you may ultimately end up having the symptoms, but the longer you can have with the full functioning, the better. Yes? Okay. So, the brain is a really complex system. Right? It's the most complex system we know of in the universe. And like any complex system, how well it works depends on the environment in which it works. And in our case, the environment with it in which our, our brain works is how we live. So what we do, or indeed what we don't do, um, the lifestyle choices that we make shape it and influence it. And they influence, influence how well it functions and how resilient it can be when faced with aging, with atrophy, with injury or disease. Okay? So we know that somehow people with cognitive reserves can activate more efficient and more um, effective uh, networks. You know, we have these neural networks in our brain firing all the time as we're speaking here. There's billions and billions of neurons in our brain sending electrical and chemical signals all around the place. Now, our brain is constantly changing, right? We used to think it was fixed. We used to think we were stuck with what we were born with, more or less. But now we know that it's changing and that it's our behaviors and our experiences can help it shape it at any age. So people say, what the scientists say is that our brain is plastic. Now, I always think of credit card plastic when people say that, but it's not that kind of plastic. It's putty plastic. It's the pliable plastic. And that's neuroplasticity. Um, and that means um, we have a neuroplasticity when we're born at the beginning of life as our brain is growing. But also as adults, every time we learn something new, every time we memorize something, our brain grows, well, gives us new neurons. So it has, it's reshaping our brain. Um, and also neuroplasticity can compensate for injury. Okay, I'm going to try and show you a little film here. Um, it explains neuroplasticity probably a little bit better than me. Um, 
see, will it play? No? Let me just go back. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's on the website and you can just... Oh. Lose my memory when I get <laughs> Your brain is shrinking. Well, if you're over 30, it is. After that, on average, you'll lose a bit less than 0.5% of your brain volume every year. Reach 90, and you may have lost over a third of your hippocampus, the seahorse-shaped bit of the brain vital for making memories. And you'll have said goodbye to 14% of your cerebral cortex, the grey matter responsible for useful things like thinking, emotions, and speech. Worse still, scientists used to believe the adult brain was fixed and unable to change, like concrete, so losing some was a serious matter. In 2000, researchers began to investigate a group of London taxi and bus drivers. The bus drivers trained for six weeks and then drove the same routes every day. Whereas the taxi drivers had trained for up to four years, memorizing some 25,000 streets. The researchers took MRI scans of both bus and taxi drivers, but it was the cabbie's brain that showed something incredible. Their brains contained far more grey matter in the back part of the hippocampus than the bus drivers. Here's what scientists think was going on. Inside our brains are trillions of synaptic connections, chemical and electrical impulses that transfer messages between the body and the brain, like millions of cabbies taking millions of patrons to different destinations. In memorizing and using their mental map of London, the cabbies' brains adapted and changed, creating more synaptic connections. So it turns out the brain isn't like concrete, but more like putty or plastic, able to adapt to our demands. Scientists call this adaptability neuroplasticity. This new discovery is great news, because while you might not be able to stop your brain shrinking, it seems you can compensate by building new connections if you stay mentally active, challenging your brain like a London cabbie. To discover more about your plastic brain, go to... Okay. Okay, so, yeah, um, so that little film and other films like it and more information about neuroplasticity are on the existing website, Hello Brain, that's aimed at everybody, um, and we'll have more, um, uh, you know, MS-specific information on the new website. So, I'm just going to talk about some key, three key messages. Cognitive impairment is not an, an inevitable inevitable with multiple sclerosis or aging. Um, our brain is resilient and we can boost the reserves in our brain. And there are things that we can do to main our, uh, maintain our brain, build resilience. And so it's really possible and important to look after our brain health. Okay. So cognitive impairment is not inevitable. Sorry, can you hear me now? Um, so there are huge individual differences in susceptibility to disease pathology or age-related changes. Um, some people, it seems, can tolerate more changes of pathology than others and still retain function. So even if you were look, to look just in terms of aging, think of, you know, 10 people that you know who are over the age of 65 and think about their, their cognitive functioning, their memory, their ability, you know, to uh, engage in conversation, discussions, plan things, decisions, you know. I mean, there's huge variability. One or two may well have been, you know, affected by a disease like Alzheimer's disease. Um, Two or three probably um, are sharp as a razor and um, could put you to shame. And then the rest of us sort of fall somewhere in the middle. So that just is, is variability. And it's, it's similar with MS. There's a variability in terms of um, how cognitive and fun uh, functioning is affected. Whoops. Yeah, I think I went the right way. Okay. So before I kind of go on to, you know, tips about brain health, I really do want to just talk a little bit about the cognitive impairment that may be expected in multiple sclerosis. Has anyone talked about this already today? No? Okay, because I just want to, you know, I don't want to spend time, you know, repeating. Okay, so se severe decline of general cognitive function in multiple sclerosis is, is, is rare. So cognitive function just describes all those things I'm talking about, memory, attention, planning, organizing, decision-making, all those kind of brain activities. Um, so the cognitive impairment can be experienced early or late. Um, it can be mild or severe. Some symptoms um, can be falsely interpreted as cognitive deficits. So things like poor articulation, poor coordination, or rapid eye movement, they're not cognitive symptoms, okay? 
Some factors also can temporarily impair your cognitive function, and that's a really important thing to remember today, okay? So things like fatigue will impair your ability to even think straight, let alone store memories. Um, just ordinary tiredness, um, you know, that's not obviously of the same sort of order of magnitude as, as, as fatigue, can also impair your functioning. Um, emotional changes, some drugs that you might be taking, relapses, physical restrictions, you know, in, encountering life, life changes, they can all impact on your cognitive functioning. They're all temporary. Okay, so don't confuse them with, you know, what, so if you're experiencing something, first kind of go through this list and, and sort of see what, what else is going on in your life. Severe stress as well as something else. Alcohol and marijuana affect the central nervous system. Now, I know some people may kind of use certainly um, marijuana, et cetera, as pain relief, et cetera. So it's, so, so it's very individual. Sometimes it can make cognitive symptoms worse. So that's something, you know, for each individual to make decisions about in and around with their own healthcare professionals, um, et cetera. But it just should be noted that it can make the cognitive symptoms worse. So for people in terms of cognitive impairment, mostly only one or two areas that I'm going to talk about here are affected. Okay, so it's not like all of them will be affected. Most people with multiple sclerosis, it's one or two of these. So memory. So memory... Um, uh, I better be careful because I could do a whole talk just on memory. So there's lots of different types of memory. You don't just have one memory. You know, you're, you have memory for events, you have semantic memory, you have prospective memory, which is the ability to remember to take your tablets at some point in the future. You have tons of different types of memory. And it's really important to remember that even if this, a, a part of your memory is affected, so there's only one particular part of, of, of memory. So your short-term memory or memory for recent events is what can be affected in multiple sclerosis. So somebody telling you, something five minutes ago and you might have difficulty re re retaining that. Um, attention, and again, there's lots of different types of attention, but what can be affected in multiple sclerosis is the ability um, to listen to more than one thing at a time or do more than one thing at a time. The ability to tune out background noise or actually even the ability to walk and talk. Okay? Concentration can be affected. Speed of processing. So that, by that, what we mean is the amount of time it takes you to kind of make sense of information, decide your response, and, you know, decide what, you, what it means, how you want to respond, and then make your response, okay? Um, problem solving, word finding, they're self-explanatory. And then we have a bunch of what we call ex executive functions, and they're handled by the frontal part of your brain, which is really the higher, higher control center. And that's things like, um, it really is like an executive sitting up there, and um, it's around prioritizing your thoughts, what, what's more important, what should I be doing first, and controlling um, expression of emotion. So that's kind of, um, if, if you're having trouble there, you may, you, you may become a little bit disinhibited. So speak inappropriately. So say out loud those things that you think when someone walks into a room. No, but you know, you know what I mean? So that, that can be, um, it can cause more problems than, than, than you might think. Uh, anyway, I'm briefly going to talk about these. The website, when it's done, will have a whole section around strategies. I just wanted to, I didn't want to come up with a list of what might can be, be affected without actually sort of saying there are things you can do around those, even if you're already affected. And I want to say that. Brain health, I, I really mean it, is for everyone who has a brain. So if you're already experiencing symptoms, still do the, you know, try and engage in a brain healthy lifestyle. You can support, what you can help to, to retain what's not affected and, and help support. But there's things outside your brain that you can do to help. So if memory aids, very simple, post-it notes, calendars, alarm, using association of ideas to actually help you encode memories better. Excuse me, I work with a neuropsychologist, his name is uh, Robert Cohn, and he just tells people if they have trouble with their memory, he works in a memory clinic, excuse me, <coughs> he says, just imagine, he says, I have a really large Jewish nose, he said, just imagine an ice cream cone on my face. <laughs> excuse me, but yeah, it's that kind of thing, just give yourself a little bit of extra help. Attention. Attention is really, really, you know, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. I know I have uh, problems with attention if I'm suffering with, with stress, you know, and I'm trying to do something and there's background noise. You know, it makes me very agitated and very angry. So really, just remove the distractions. Turn the bloody radio off. Turn the television off. 
just give your brain the chance that it needs um, without other things going on. Mindfulness can work for some people or being present minded. Um, mindfulness doesn't work for everybody. It's superb, but it's some, for, for, for some people it can make them more um, stressed, but for, for others it can be just superb. Rest. Um, pace yourself. Take time. Speed of processing. What I want to say about this is it's, 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 it's you know, it just, your brain processes slow down a little bit, right? And what happens is people get frustrated and they get angry with themselves and they get stressed and stress releases hormones called cortisol that go into your memory centers and make it even harder for you to find the information. Look, if you have mobility issues, you give yourself time. You know that it's going to take you longer to walk from A to B. It's the exact same. Just give yourself time. And the, the thing is, if you just relax into it and pace, you just need that extra second and it will happen. But if you start stressing about it, it's not going to happen. So just give yourself permission to take time. Be patient and um, practice and remove distractions again. Similarly, word finding, it, it's almost like play that game. Start describing it and, and use anything else that you can to get the message out there. Um, executive functioning is very similarly to the speed of processing. Just take, step back, take time, think and set your goals, prioritize what is important, what's not important. Don't overload yourself. Okay, so moving on then to just talk about reserve. The brain is resilient, even if you do have diseases. And that resilient, resilience is linked to lifestyle factors. As I said already, there's no direct relationship between the extent of disease and the clinical symptoms in the brain. What we now know, so 1989, going back to Katzman and his discovery, we now know that 25% of people during autopsy who satisfied the criteria for a full diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease were clinically intact before they died. Okay, so 25% of people, um, uh, older adults that we're looking at now, um, who, who have sufficient pathology have built up some sort of reserves. We'd like to up that number uh, and that applies to everybody here you know because in, in, in later life um, we need to be considering that as well so that's even in the face of disease uh, and, and physical damage so um, cognitive reserve actually is sort of a subset of a thing called neurological reserve which I want to just talk to you now if you don't mind I'm just going to take a sip of water so multiple sclerosis causes damage to the brain and the spinal cord now, our body actually does have a natural repair system. It has mechanisms. Mechanisms exist to repair the physical damage in our central nervous system. And in a sense, that's called our neurological reserve. It, the brain has an inbuilt, and here's the important thing, but finite capacity to retain function by remodeling itself to compensate for the loss of nerve cells and nerve fibers in the central nervous system. And it's, it's really amazing capacity that it has. And it does this by rerouting signals via undamaged areas. And it also then adapts un, undamaged areas to take on new functions that they, they, they were never responsible for before. It's an amazing thing. I mean, I really do think our brains are amazing. Now, problem is, it finds difficulty keeping pace with disease activity. So basically what's going on in multiple sclerosis may be going on too fast for the neural reserve to keep up and so you start manifest it's that point that you start manifesting symptoms and um, the neural reserves become exhausted they're depleted and that's that point point. Um, and you're left also as well and um, bearing back in mind that film that we spoke about everybody's brain is shrinking um, everybody has atrophy, atrophy as we age. In multiple sclerosis, that goes as a, as a bit of a faster pace. Um, and so then in later life, you may be left with fewer resources to compensate for that age-related atrophy. So maximizing lifelong brain health is like trying to preserve your neurological reserves, trying to give that natural resource a boost. Okay, so neurological reserve is sort of thought to have two components, brain reserve and cognitive reserve. Brain reserve refers more to the volume, the size 
uh, of the brain, the quantity of tissues, the number of neurons that you have. Whereas cognitive reserve refers to the ability of the brain to actively compensate or to make more effective and, and efficient use, use of brain networks. Both of those things make independent contra contribution to clinical resilience of the disease pathology. So our lifetime time exposures, including educational and occupational attainment and leisure activities that we engage in, can increase our cognitive reserves and also help to maintain our brain reserves. Now, all other things being equal, people with MS who have high cognitive reserve lose less cognitive function than those with less cognitive reserve for the same amount of physical damage in their brain, measured in terms of the lesions in their brain and the brain atrophy. Okay, so that brings us right back to that thing of the same amount of damage, but if you have more reserve, you've less clinical symptoms. Um, okay, so I want to tell you very, very briefly um, about a study in, in the United States. Again, it's in aging. It was called the Cognitive Aging Study, and they were interested in looking at the relationship be between education and stimulating mental activities. 488 older adults took part in the study. It was over five years. They were all over 65. The stimulating activities that they took part in weren't anything, you know, <laughs> Fancy. It wasn't rocket science or anything. It was reading, writing, crossword puzzles, games, discussions, music. Over the course of the five years, 101 of them went on to develop dementia. Now, the unit of measurement that the um, uh, scientists used um, was one activity for one day per week. Now, they found in the individuals who went on to develop dementia that one activity for one day per week delayed the onset of rapid memory loss for two months. Yeah, I heard someone saying Jesus. Like you. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's kind of a good payoff, isn't it? Um, so, and, and the good thing was that that positive effect was independent of education level. So even if the, some of those people left school at 12, they still got the benefit in later life. That's the real important take home message. I believe education is for life. We have to forget about thinking about it as something in school and university. Have to keep, keep educating ourselves, building our reserves, working on it. We don't know how it works. We don't know how this resilience works. It could be that we have more brain reserves, more neurons, more connections, or it could be more compensatory me mechanisms. Tons of researchers are working on it. In the interim, we should be working on it for our own brains um, to give ourselves the best chance. Um, so, brain healthy lifestyle. Okay, we know that those with better cardiovascular health, who've been more physically, socially, and mentally active, who've adopted healthy eating habits, who don't smoke, who drink alcohol in moderation, are less likely on average to develop dementia. Now those same principles also apply for brain health in terms of MS. It's really, you know, it's a healthy lifestyle and it's an active lifestyle. That's what's really important and particularly in the context of multiple sclerosis where you may have mobility issues and, and, and may think, oh, I can't do physical activity. That's where the most evidence is for benefit, is physical activity. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a minute. But basically, um, down that, what I said there at the bottom, um, Yakov Stern is the key researcher in the area of cognitive reserve. And what he says is, we have the ingredients, but not the recipe. We don't know that it's, you know, six ounces of this and ten ounces of that. We just know what I've said there, that on average, those, taking part in those activities gets, gives you a better chance. So you can divide some of the brain-healthy lifestyle things into, into three groups. So cardiovascular health is really important. What's good for your heart? is good for your brain. Most people are really, like dental health, really well educated about heart health. It's just a damn pump for your brain, you know? Um, but um, you have to watch out. You have to manage hypertension. If you've never had your blood pressure tested, go get it tested. Because once you manage hypertension, well, then that risk is kind of gone. Similarly with diabetes, um, obesity, important to keep, keep your... Um, your, uh, you know, your weight under control. Um, depression, social isolation and loneliness, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about those in a few minutes. Um, smoking, excess drinking and um, low physical activity and low levels of mental activity increase risk. Um, okay. Uh, this is another little short film I'm going to show to you. It should be just about two minutes and then I'll wind down with tips for uh, brain health. What can you do to keep your brain healthy? We all know high cholesterol isn't good for our bodies, along with high blood pressure and being overweight. 
But what you might not know is that not only can these health concerns shorten the life of your body, they can affect your brain function. The more scientists study our brains, the more they're finding that how well it works is intricately tied to the health of our body. For example, just 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times a week can keep your brain sharp. Because physical exercise not only helps your heart, it can increase the size of your hippocampus, a part of the brain crucial to making memories. But that's not all. Physical exercise generates a chemical called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which acts like fertilizer for the brain, encouraging the growth of neural connections and new brain cells. So, obviously staying active is important, but not just physically active. You need to keep socially active as well, especially as you get older. Because there's growing evidence to suggest that people who can avoid getting lonely reduce their risk of cognitive decline. Something we all agree is a good thing. But there's one last thing you need to do to keep your brain healthy. Keep it active. So, in no particular order, here are three top ways to keep your brain stimulated. Number one, challenge yourself. The satisfaction you get from doing things slightly beyond your comfort zone actually changes your brain chemistry, making you feel more positive. Number two, change yourself. Novelty helps your brain, so it's good to experience new things, take on new situations and meet new people. And number three, learn something new. This encourages the growth of new brain cells and stimulates the connections between them, which has its own benefits because stronger brain connections also help keep your brain healthy. So don't let age stop you from doing the things you love. Think young, because if you look after your brain now, keeping it active and engaged, it will make you proud for years to come. So that's one of our little films from the, the, the website. The new ones will be more MS uh, specific. But basically, here's the top tips for brain health. Get physically active, stay socially engaged, challenge your brain. This fourth one here, I, I talk about attitude. Now, it's really about managing stress is one of the, the biggest ones. Um, and then the other one is adapting your lifestyle, and that's things around smoking, diet, managing your weight, that sort of thing. So why get physically active? Your brain needs, it's the biggest consumer of nutrients and oxygen. And so it really needs a good supply. Physical activity has direct benefits on the structure and function of your brain, and inactivity is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, research shows that aerobic fitness in people with multiple sclerosis results in faster information process, um, processing and preserved tissue volume. Okay, so that's good news. Um, so the exercise actually helps to grow brain connections um, and it's associated with better cognitive function. And actually increased activity in the part of your brain that's responsible for attention, one of the areas that can be affected in multiple sclerosis. So, you know, it's about finding ways. I was delighted to hear there's a drumming exercise here because actually that's one of the things that I would suggest. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, you can find a way. There's lots of different ways. It's aerobic exercise is the, is the point. And doing something you love is what's the point too. Um, staying socially engaged, I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. I really can't. I spoke at a conference last week in Scotland about social isolation and loneliness as a health issue. I've actually had a one-to-one -one meeting with our Minister for Older Persons to ask them to put it on the agenda as a real health issue. Loneliness is a killer, okay? If you are lonely, socially isolated, or living alone, you are 20, between 26% and 30% more likely to die, irrespective of age. That's not just for old people. That's across the lifespan. And I just think it's really important in terms of multiple sclerosis, okay? Because there are issues and risks about not being able to stay in the workforce about, you know, maybe around depression, around disengaging uh, for whatever reason, around um, having multiple sclerosis. You just can't let yourself do it. There's a direct relationship between the neural number of social networks that you have in your life and the, and, and the neural networks in your brain. People with more social ties live longer, have better health, they're less depressed, and they're less likely to develop cognitive impairment. Just 10 minutes of social interaction can increase your brain performance. Um, it really is better than probably better than doing crosswords and stuff like that.
and it's probably more fun. Um, but you do have to make an effort. Do you know? You, you have to work at it. Um, so challenging your brain, you kind of heard about in the film, and I won't spend that long on it because I'm really at risk of going over time. Um, but uh, lifelong learning, education, it doesn't matter what the thing is that you do. It just needs to have learning in it. Uh, it needs to challenge yourself. If you get good at it, like a PlayStation game, push yourself to the next level. That's the point. If you're on a comfortable zone, your brain's not getting any real benefit from it. doesn't matter. Learn, singing, I don't know, French, learn how to play the drums. It, it, that doesn't matter. Just it's the learning and the challenging yourself and the novelty that's, um, that's what's important. Um, attitude. There's lots of different things in here. I just want to very briefly talk about stress. Um, because any sort of chronic uh, illness or disease in and of itself can be stressful. It can be stressful on your body, but it can be stressful on relationships. It can be stressful in so, so many ways. Um, the thing is, chronic stress. Now, acute stress is good. Acute stress is what um, you know, uh, helps you to deal with ch certain challenges in life, but it's meant to be short-term and short-lived, like running away from a tiger in a jungle or fighting someone who's mugging you. It's not meant to happen all the time. So the stress response releases um, stress hormones into your system, cortisol, shuts everything else down that's not necessary like digestion, eventually your immune function shuts down the growth of new neurons in your brain so that all energies, for example, go to the muscles in your legs so you can run away as fast as you can. Okay, you can see how that's great in the short term, not so good in the long term. Um, actually, stress in the short term, cortisol to your memory centers increases and enhances your memory performance. Why is that? Because you need to remember where that danger was, what that danger was, how you got away from it. But if it's there all the time on an ongoing basis, it wreaks absolute havoc with your brain. And what happens is your hippocampus, the seahorse bit of the brain that we talked about, that starts to shrink and the connections get damaged, and that's the memory center and the learning center. So you get this vicious loop. But also another thing happens with stress. The amygdala, another part of your brain, gets bigger. And what's the amygdala responsible for? Fear. And you start to become more fearful of life and fearful of other people, and you can get into this cycle, actually, of disengaging socially. So managing stress. Be selective about what you stress about. Okay, you know, some stuff is stressful, but be selective and try and manage it and try and plan for it. Um, finally, then, it's the lifestyle stuff. Smoking is a no-no. If I want you to walk away with anything on this, it's smoking cigarettes. Don't. And then managing sleep. Sleep is where all the restoration occurs, um, and particularly in memory. Um, memories are made while you sleep. Uh, cognitive function, you need it for your best cognitive function. And my final tip is to smile. I prescribe smiling five times a day, okay? Now you're laughing, that's brilliant, because that's really good for your brain, okay? But seriously, smiling actually has health benefits, and there's tons of research on this. It boosts, listen to this now, you just heard what I said about stress. Now listen to what I have to say about smiling. It boosts the growth of brain cells in your hippocampus, um, which is the area responsible for learning and memory that we're talking about. It makes your brain more resilient. It releases hormones that make you feel good. It actually lowers blood pressure and it boosts your immune function. So it protects against stress, anxiety, and depression. The simple act of smiling, okay, even if you don't feel like it, actually, is especially if you don't feel like it. The act of smiling gives you all those benefits. So it's just the muscle thing. Do you know what I mean? We all think, oh, I don't feel like smiling. It doesn't matter, damn. Make the muscle smile. So I say, smile first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Shh, smile at one other person at least during the day, because then you're sharing and passing on the health benefits, and you can do whatever you want with the other two smiles. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has questions. I don't know if there's a roving mic or... So this lady just said, smile and the world smiles with you. Weep and you weep alone. Yeah, you know, it just smiling just has health benefits.
Yes, it does. It does. Although it's hard sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't feel like it. Yes. I'm diverging a little bit uh, towards the Alzheimer's because it's in the family. Um, my mother has it and about three of her others have had it and died. Is there any scientific evidence to say it runs in the family? Um, so my own mum had dementia. Um, uh, so I've walked that journey very ironically, you know, considering my area of work. Uh, so I understand the worry. I mean, I worry every time I forget something, every time. Um, so basically, um, there's more evidence towards risk factors, seven major risk factors, which are actually things like hypertension, um, diabetes, obesity, those kind of things. Um, there may be a small familial element for the early onset, um, dementia. However, what you have to understand with it running in families is lots of families share lifestyles. So it may not be the, the genetics of it. There is one um, allele that, that increases your risk if, 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 of having it, but it's what we call not necessary or sufficient. So that means that some people who have it don't get the disease and some people who don't have it get the disease. So it's, it, you know, it, it's not a huge thing. So it's, it's hard to tease apart that thing about shared lifestyles. Hi Sabina, we have a question in for you via Twitter. It's from Declan Groker and he's wondering how do we recognize the difference between brain skill symptoms and normal aging problems? Okay, uh, so normal aging issues, I mean, there's a lot over the years have been put down to, to, to normal aging. You know, cognitive decline is not a normal part of aging, okay? Um, so as we get older, we can expect to be a little bit slower in our responding and to have a little bit of difficulty in terms of memory for recent uh, events. But actually, a lot of those problems um, in later life are more around um, probably attention. We get a little bit more absent-minded. Um, and so what it is, is we're not in the present moment. And so attention is the first step in the memory process. So uh, you have to attend what you're doing, um, you then encode it, then it's consolidated in your brain, and then at one point, whoa, um, uh, then, then at a later point you can retrieve it. Um, so that's really what you would expect um, in later life. I mean, I would suggest anybody who's... Um, any concerns, really go see your, see your doctor. There's lots of, particularly... Um, Why is it... Oh, it's doing all sorts of things. Oh, um, oh, I just want to run away <laughs> from the stress of it. Um, uh, what was I saying there? Uh, uh, yes, the thing is, as well, lots of things can interfere with cognitive function. Um, we have an issue in terms of, um, as I said earlier, the thing that people fear most about growing old actually is dementia. I mean, you know, it shows that. And so people experience symptoms and then they don't go to a doctor. Now, there's lots of things. It could be a side effect of medication. It could be something like a vitamin B12 deficiency. It could be drinking too much alcohol. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, stress, um, depression can manifest like a dementia. Um, so there's lots of things first um, that you kind of need to rule out uh, before. And I hope that answers the question to the person on Twitter.